When an empire crumbles and the masses are banging down the door, what's an empress to do? Today we're talking about Empress Eugenie's flight from Paris. Hey everyone, I'm Christine and welcome to Footnoting History. As the 1870s dawned, France was on the verge of a revolution, again. This time, the tide was turning against the Second French Empire, which, much like the First French Empire, was headed by a Bonaparte, Napoleon III. He was the youngest son of Napoleon I's brother Louis and Josephine's daughter Hortense. As I mentioned in a past podcast, this was a conscious pairing on Napoleon I's part, and it meant that children would exist combining his and Josephine's bloodline even though they never had children themselves. He did, of course, later have his own son, recognized by Napoleon III as Napoleon II, even though the Napoleon II never actually ruled. So, our Emperor Napoleon III actually began as President of the French Republic in 1848. This was a government that came into existence after the monarchy that had replaced Napoleon I was overthrown, because... This is 19th century France, and they really, really like their revolutions. A few years later, not unlike his uncle, he staged a coup that made him emperor. His wife was a Spanish woman almost 20 years his junior named Eugenie, and it's her flight into exile that's the focus of our episode today. They made an odd-looking pair. He was not considered very attractive with his heavy eyelids and long mustache. By comparison, her fair complexion and light eyes got her called one of the greatest beauties of her time. Together, the couple, whose relationship really should be a podcast unto itself, had one son, Napoleon Louis. They called him Louis, and so will we, because we don't need any more Napoleons in this episode. The Second Empire gave people the physical Paris that we recognize today. It was an ornate time that included knocking down large parts of the old, cramped city and making way for wide boulevards. It saw periods of economic prosperity, railway expansion, a universal trade exhibition, an increase in schools, and a return to the grand court life that hadn't been seen since the First Empire. However, it also annoyed people by taking down their homes in the plans for renovation while other groups either resented the end of the Republic or wanted the return of the last monarchy. There occurred multiple moments of failure and embarrassment on the international stage that didn't exactly help things either. Napoleon III was regarded as a quiet, kind man who was forward-thinking in many ways, but seriously lacked a flair for foreign relations, and it was this that would ultimately prove to be his undoing. The Empress Eugenie was not unlike a late 1800s version of Marie Antoinette, a historical figure who was actually known to have fascinated her. She was viewed as cold, as well as a disappointing match for an emperor because she was neither royal nor French, and she was sometimes severely disliked for the influence she had over her husband. Yet, at the same time, people who met her commented on her graciousness, dignity, and deep laugh. She was seen as high-strung, but also as intelligent. When something went wrong, it was not unusual for her to be lambasted in the press as that Spanish woman. All the while, people were still copying her every fashion move. During her tenure as empress, she oversaw things like the opening of the Suez Canal, and it was her who had the first woman decorated with the French Legion of Honor. The longer the Second Empire lasted, the more cracks showed, highlighted by failures of policy abroad and in the person of the emperor, whose health was just never very good. The straw that broke the camel's back came in 1870. You may remember the name Otto von Bismarck from one history class or another. He was the man who consolidated a bunch of places into one Germany. Well, this was his era, and he was slowly moving Prussia and German areas of Europe in a very strong direction. France didn't like seeing him creating a European power when that's what they wanted to be. A series of events that included creating a fear in France of being completely encircled by Bismarck-created allied powers led to a war that Napoleon III had really, really wanted to avoid. But off he went, taking his son with him and leaving Eugenie in Paris as regent. 
Then, in September of 1870, the emperor was taken prisoner in battle. When word of this catastrophe hit Paris, it was Eugenie's worst nightmare, and at first she erupted in anger and denial, but she didn't run away. She remained in the Tuileries Palace, even holding her council meeting while things outside grew dire. The legislative body of France, aided or pushed depending on how you looked at it, by the help of the mobs that flooded into their meeting chamber, declared it was time for the next incarnation of the French Republic. Simultaneously, aware of the mounting crowds outside, the Empress was being strongly advised to abdicate and get the heck out of Paris before the crowds reached the palace. People remembered all too well how overblown monarchs were treated, and even how the palace had been broken into in the past. It was all very dramatic and understandably terrifying. Mobs were by now banging on the gates of the gardens. Word reached the Empress that the Imperial Eagles on the gates were being torn down by the crowds, and if she remained much longer, everyone in the palace would be in danger. Eugenie finally agreed to leave. The flag that flew over the palace, indicating a sovereign was there, was lowered. Eugenie and one attendant were going to leave together, but had no idea how to do it. Going through the palace would surely put them in harm's way. Instead, they did something that sounds as exciting to me as it was likely horrifying to them. They escaped through the Louvre. That's right, the museum. With the aid of several friends and, wonderfully, museum attendants, they made their way through the art galleries of the darkened museum that you and I can visit today. When they finally reached the exit, it opened onto a main street. To remain incognito, they were dressed in black with heavy veils. They waited with bated breath for a crowd to pass by and took a cab away, a cab which allowed Eugenie to see the very crowd she had been trying to avoid as they rioted in the streets. One question loomed large. Where was the Empress to go? She had to be very careful if she wanted to avoid some sort of unpredictable but no doubt incredibly unpleasant end. Finding that she and her attendant were very low on funds, and that several people she had hoped would help her were now not willing to do so, she went to the house of Thomas Evans. But he was not at home, so she waited for him in his library for over an hour. All right, so we ask ourselves, who the heck was Thomas Evans? He was an American dentist from Pennsylvania. Yep, that's right, an American. Renowned for his use of gold in tooth fillings, he had been working with another American dentist in Paris. But one day, when that dentist fell ill, Evans attended the then-future Emperor Napoleon III in his place, and a friendship began. The relationship transcended the professional to the highest level of personal. Evans even reportedly convinced Napoleon III that it would be a bad idea to side with the Confederacy during the American Civil War, regardless of how much France wanted the cotton. That was clearly very clever on Evans' part and saved them a bit of embarrassment. Now he was turning his attention to bettering the care of wounded French soldiers in the very war that had just caused the deposition of the Empress. When he found the ladies, the Empress told him of her plight, though he too was already aware of what was happening in the streets. He later remembered her as saying, The service I now ask, in my behalf, and in that of the lady who is with me, will be a severe test of your friendship. He agreed to help her, and she confided, I am no longer fortunate. The evil days have come, and I am left alone. Her husband was captive, she did not know the location of her son, and she had no home and no other friends except for Dr. Evans, and she needed him to help her reach England. She had a passport, procured some time prior, that declared her to be an invalid who needed help to get home. She had not wanted it and had sworn that she would never desert the empire, but now she was not given any choice. Evans enlisted the help of a fellow American doctor, the future editor of his memoirs, Dr. Crane, and the two became their guardians. The night did not pass easily for anyone, particularly the Empress, who had hours to think about the horrible turn her life had taken. At about 5 a.m., acting as the supposedly ill woman's doctor and brother, Evans and Crane took the ladies by carriage away from Paris and down toward the coast, riding as long as possible before having to stop and change horses, and staying at inns that were, shall we say, less than superb. 
They arrived on the coast to find Dr. Evans's wife, Agnes, who was there on a holiday. Only a week before, Evans had been there with her, but now circumstances were slightly less relaxed. Evans took the Empress into the hotel through the back gardens and up to Agnes's rooms, while Crane helped her attendant through the front door. Inside, food and drink were had by all. They had avoided the Paris mobs, but another difficulty lay in their path. They needed to cross the channel. After debating between taking a regular passenger boat and trying to hire someone privately, they decided to continue to avoid being in public no matter how hidden the Empress was in appearance. Just like the difficulties Eugenie had before she called on Dr. Evans, the dentist had a hard time scouting out a ship to sail them to England. He set his eyes on a yacht called the Gazelle that was owned by an Englishman named Sir John Burgoyne. Burgoyne was totally not interested in getting involved in any of this, but, like only a wise man would do, he decided to put the situation to his wife, and Lady Burgoyne agreed to assist the fleeing empress. Evans told the gentleman that the bigger the responsibility of the task, the bigger the honor, but Burgoyne never was really at ease with the situation. Nevertheless, in the darkness of midnight, the Burgoynes welcomed the party aboard, save for Dr. Crane and Agnes Evans, who were going to remain in France. Safety, it seemed, was finally in sight. So it was that with an English couple and an American doctor, the Empress and her attendant set sail for England and quite literally into a deadly squall, which is, well, it's exactly where we're going to leave them today. Irving Berlin once asked, what can you do with a general when he stops being a general? And today we have to ask, what can you do with an empress when she stops being an empress? Or can you ever stop being an empress when you technically never abdicated? What awaited Eugenie in England? What was happening to her husband? And where on earth was their son and heir Louis? So many questions and so many loose ends, all of which we will hopefully tie up in our next episode, which I'll be calling Life After Empire. This has been Footnoting History. If you like the podcast, be sure to visit our website, footnotinghistory.com, where you can find links to further reading suggestions related to this week's episode, as well as a calendar of upcoming podcasts. You can also like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at History Footnote. Until next time, remember... The best stories are always in the footnotes. See you next week. <laughs>